first off, I want to thank everyone for joining me tonight with Career Innovations Q&A session. This is a weekly workshop we put on every week. Um, this session is recorded. You can definitely check this out on our YouTube channel. Anytime you miss a session, you can definitely go ahead and go to our YouTube channel. It's Career Innovations, all one word. And you're able to look through our um, library by topic and pick any type of workshop that you'd like to listen to. If this is your first time joining us, you can ask questions one or two ways. You can raise your hand, depending on how you logged in. If you entered your audio PIN number, I can unmute your mic and you can verbally ask your question. Um, if you do not want to verbally speak, you can type your question in the keypad or actually in the um, question panel below. I advise you to go ahead and do that while we're going through the slides. That way I can get to your question or your question be one of the first questions I actually get to following the slides. Um, I really do encourage everyone to send their questions prior to the workshop. That way we can actually put together the slides and have a more informed answer. We had some great questions that came in um, that we're going to address. As you can see, our topic today is Roadmap for Success. And if this is the first time joining us, um, I like to go. I like to go over um, what Career Innovations is and who we are. Um, well, I'm Bridget Back, and I'm the founder of Career Innovations. We're actually an executive search firm. We find a lot of our top talent uh, by referrals and networking, and a lot of um, innovative and unconventional ways to um, locate and retain top talent. As you can see from the slides, some of the services that we do offer in addition to our training sessions, we do resume writing and editing. We also do career coaching. Market research is done for employers as well as candidates to find the jobs that are out there and the decision makers to hire for them. We also um, do compensation benchmarking, referral retention workshops as well. I like to start each session with a quote. Today's quote is to be successful. You must accept all challenges that come your way. You can't just accept the ones you like. So I thought that was a good quote to start off with. So let's go ahead and start with the first question that came in. Someone asked about LinkedIn. Um, and this was pretty much a straightforward answer and I encourage anyone that's looking for a job, not only a job, but looking to network, um, to reinvent themselves, to, and, you know, recreate their career, whatever you're trying to do out there, LinkedIn is a great professional platform. And I know a lot of people know about it and me talking about it may be so redundant, but you'll be amazed how many people actually aren't utilizing it. They may have a profile, but they're not really doing anything about it. So the question was, what can some ways or what are some ways a long-term unemployed job seeker can increase their um, visibility on LinkedIn it will help them obtain careers and give some type of return on investment. Um, so I'm going to talk about some ways that you can actually increase your visibility on LinkedIn. And the first thing I tell people to do is the first step is to first update your profile. And I know a lot of people on the line may say, well, I have a LinkedIn profile. I have, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. And I go to their profile and it's, you know, I call it a skeleton profile. You know, they don't have a picture, they don't have a title, or they may just have the company they work for. They really don't outline what they do there. They may have, you know, their education. And, and it's very, um, I, that's why I say it, it's very um, sparse, sparse. It's really, really hardly nothing on the page other than, you know, not even their full resume. So the first thing I would tell anyone to do is have a completed profile. This means adding your keywords, a relevant hot headline. And what I mean about a relevant headline, not job seeker looking for new opportunities. No one is searching job seeker. When I say relevant, you want to be using keywords that actual recruiters and actual and actual hiring managers are going to be using to search for someone that can do a particular skill. They're not searching job seeker. That's not a keyword they're typing in there. They're not searching unemployed. And I see a lot of people that are using their headline as either unemployed, you know, um, 
gracefully looking, you know, things like that that may be catchy in your eyes, but it's really not helping the search process. So you want to make sure that you're picking out a headline that, that actually are going to contain keywords that people that are searching for you are going to use to find your profile. If anyone's ever takes a look at my LinkedIn profile under Bridget Back, and my whole entire headline is what I do. I do recruiting, headhunting, so if anyone ever looks for type C and recruiter or type C and headhunter, Charlotte, North Carolina, I'm the first profile that pops up. You know, so you want to definitely make sure that you're using keywords that people are going to be able to search for you for. After you do that, and make sure before you start adding connections, that's where I put that second or third, I should say, you want to make sure your profile is going to be packed with information that people can actually look at and determine whether or not they want to connect with you. I have a lot of people that connect with or, or reach out or send a connection to people and they wonder why well, they're not connecting back. Nobody wants to connect with a, with a blank profile. So you want to make sure that you're actually putting some content in there they're going to, that's going to make you a valuable connection. Um, and once you start reaching out to people and getting those connections you want to start joining groups that are in your industry or in your expertise and you want to become active on LinkedIn and I'm going to talk about how you can be active being active on LinkedIn also requires you I'm not even going to say it's optional it also requires you to become active offline I met a lot of people I met in real life that became real good connections on LinkedIn. So you want to make sure that in order for you to be productive online, that you're also building that offline relationship. So you want to bring your profile, you want to bring up your profile and develop it to actually become visible offline. Because that's the thing, when I meet people at networking events or I meet people at different type of conferences, the first thing they do is give me their business card and say, let's connect on LinkedIn. Now I can put a face with a name, a personality with a name, a company with a name. I've met this person. Now this person is going to be a more enriching connection versus someone that I just send a connection to that probably is just never going to talk to again. And that's what happens. People just connect, people just collect connections and they really aren't interacting with the connections that they have. So you really want to make sure that your profile is, bri is bridging some type of offline connections as well. Get introductions. That's another way that LinkedIn can help you um, get out of being unemployed. And I see this person said they've been unemployed for a long time or, or long-term unemployment. And that may be a, a totally different issue or topic in itself. But you want to make sure that you're getting some type of in-person, and I made sure I put that in parentheses, in-person introductions. Use LinkedIn to get in-person introductions, which means that, again, you're just not connecting with someone because they work for a company that you want to work for, but you're not really doing anything to break the ice beyond a I accept this person's connection. You want to make sure that you're putting some type of plan in place that you can build a relationship with this person offline, whether it's catching a, a cup of coffee together, meeting up for lunch. It doesn't even have to be a physical connection. It can be a five to 15 minute phone call. What can I do to bridge this gap of communication offline? You want to make sure that you're trying to do something offline to build an actual professional relationship. Next thing is you want to use this as a tool to follow up. I know a lot of people that say I've been applying online. I've, you know, I have a spreadsheet of all these companies I apply to. Are you using LinkedIn as a way to follow up with decision makers? Which means are you reaching out to them? or reaching out to the people or companies that you apply to or even interested in, in pursuing. And I tell people when they when they tell me that they're using LinkedIn as a networking tool and they really think that collecting connection is connect connections is networking. And it's not. Networking is what happens after you hit that connect button. That's networking. Networking is in, hey, what's the status on that job I applied to? 
that's not networking. I see a lot of people get confused with that. Well, I asked for a status update or I reached out and asked about a job that they had open on their website. That's not connecting. That's inquiring about something that probably over 100 people may have already inquired about. You have done nothing different or in the innovative in that particular situation. So you want to find a way that you can make a connection outside of asking for a status update. In your case, see how you can bring value to that organization. So when you connect, you can bring something to the table. Hey, I saw that you guys are rolling out this new service, or I saw, or I saw a newsletter, or I saw something that was out there that piqued their interest that you know what their company is doing that you can actually use as an icebreaker to talk about or bring ideas to the table. If you find that they may be going through a particular uh, a road bump in, in a particular situation, they may, you know, business may be slow or they may be having a, a problem hiring the right people. Give some type of advice. So you want to make sure that you're going to bring something to the table that's going to engage them to even want to communicate with you other than, hey, what's the status on that job I applied to? Next is polish your skills. And this goes to the to the initial question when I, I pulled out some details about being long term, uh, being a long term unemployed job seeker. I also want you to use this time as you're you know renovating your linkedin profile you also want to look way look at ways to polish the skills that you already have or obtain new skills that are going to increase your chances of getting hired so if you've been unemployed for a very long time and we're now in 2015 the economy is starting to pick up or had in some set and some sectors has already recovered you know so in, in some industries i don't know what industry this particular person is in, but in some industries, the economy has 100% recovered. Some industries is kind of slow, but it all in all is starting to grow. So if you're starting to find that you're still struggling trying to find a job, you want to look at ways to polish your skill set to get back in the game. And I've said this on many, many workshops before. What got you the job 10 years ago may not get you the job today because the requirements change, the skill sets have changed, and the expectations of companies have changed. With the economy getting tight, companies are being more and more um, conservative with their money, and they're also being more and more particular about what they're spending their money on. So you want to make sure that if you're going to if you want to get hired, you're going to bring something to the table, and you also want to make sure that you're going to be able to meet the requirements and the demands of the company. So that may include going out there and getting some skills or getting whatever you may need to be competitive with the workforce that exists now in 2015. And I hope that was able to answer your question. And I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next one. I had someone that asked me, um, should I leave a job that I started about four or five months ago for a new job that offered me a level up in much more salary than I applied for um, a while back? So this lets me know that this is a position that you applied for a while back and it looks like you applied for another job that seemed like they moved a little faster in the recruiting process you were hired at this particular job and now the job that you applied to before you got this job comes along and says hey we want you you know sorry it took us so long to make this decision but we want to hire you too but now you're already about four or five months into your new job so you're asking me what should you do? Should you take the job or whatnot? In this particular slide, as you can see the title, it's the price of integrity. Um, I want everyone to take a look at this slide and I have this broken up into two, um, two sections. So you can see your current job and your job offer that you have on the table. Your current job is what are the pros and cons of your current job? And not to sound kind of snobby on the first question, like why did you take the position, but you really want to ask yourself, why did you accept the position? It's a reason why you took that position. 
And it sounds like if you apply to the job and you're getting job offers now, <laughs> when you currently have a job, it sounds like you may be in an industry where your skill sets are in demand or, or you're a type of person, you have a background that, you know, that showcases that people want to hire you. So you want to ask yourself, why did you take this position? And it's okay to say, hey, I took this position because I was desperate, you know, because people out there take positions as placeholders, whether or not they want to accept it, believe it, or confess to it. There are people out there that, hey, this is not my dream job, but guess what? I got bills to pay. So I can understand if, hey, I took this job because I needed a job. If that's how you answer that question, that's fine. Next one, is there room for growth? Is the company stable and what's the outlook? You want to ask yourself this question. And maybe people on the line that says, well, this, this question doesn't pertain to me. In a way, it does. Because if you're out there looking for a job, this can happen to anyone. You can get accepted a job offer next month and a job that you interviewed for a month ago can call you. It happens. The hiring process definitely can overlap, especially if you are, are applying to a lot of jobs. And I know people out there, they're applying to 20, 30 jobs a day if they can. So you want to make sure if you're with a job that there's room for growth, it's stable, and you kind of know the outlook, which means that you've been, for this, you've been with this company for four or five months. You're out of the 90-day probationary period. So you kind of already know where the company stands. You know what the company's stable. You know if they, ha if they have high turnover. You can see if someone's hired today and gone tomorrow. So you kind of already know the feel of the corporate culture that you're in. So you want to take a step back and say, hey, even if I didn't get this job, on intentions of staying, is there actually room for me to stay? Is there a potential to actually grow with this company? And you also want to look at what are your current commitments. Again, I don't know what industry you in, you're in. You didn't tell me in the question, but I know in some particular jobs and industries, a lot of people may have commitments, which means they may be managing a team. They may be working on a project. They may have be doing something that, hey, I can't just quit on a dime and leave. Or you can, but that takes us to the, to the third point I'm going to stress. Let's look at the job offer. Besides the title and the salary, what does this company have to offer? And I'm going to repeat that question. Besides the title and the salary, what does this job have to offer? Titles and salaries are gone today, or here today, gone tomorrow. Look at the economy. And a lot of people lost their jobs. This wasn't just, you know, the auto industry. This wasn't just the housing industry. This wasn't just the banking industry. There were a lot of companies that, that let a lot of good people go. So you want to make sure that if you are going to take this job offer, you're basing it more on the stability of the company and the outlook of the company versus the title and the salary. That's just my recommendation. You don't have to do that. But I just think that having being with a company, I'd rather be with a company that's more stable and has potential to grow with versus having a, 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 a big salary but not knowing if I'm going to have a job next month. That's the difference, if you know what I mean. I know a lot of people that live on the edge. They got a great job, make great money, but they can get cut anytime. And if you're in the sales field, you know it. You're about as good as your last sale. You know, as long as you're selling, selling, you're, you know, hey, you get those attaboys. But once you're not, you're out of there. So it's, it's some jobs out there that, you know, if you're doing great, you have a job. So you want to make sure that are you basing this on the title and salary or are you looking more for stability and growth? And will accepting this job offer bring you closer to your professional goals? That's something that you also want to consider. And it takes me down to the Debbie Downers. <laughs> and those are the last two points I want to make. Those are the burnt bridges. Um, no matter what you decide to do, and it's more so if you decide to leave your current job than the job offer. I really think that if you're dealing with a company that has some integrity, 
they will actually look at that as a good thing that you know what you're right you took a job offer we dragged our feet we lost a good candidate but if you're ever looking for something give us a call that's what i would do you know i will respect your decision if you did decline but what will happen if you did take the job offer you may burn some bridges which means that if you haven't been in you haven't even been there a year you haven't even been there six months you've been only there four or five months you know, so keep in mind that you're going to burn a bridge because even though if the company is OK with your leaving, newsflash, they're not. And I can tell you, even though they may put on the happy face that, hey, no, no problem. Go ahead. Chase your dreams. You know, behind closed doors, they are not happy with your leaving with with you leaving. First of all, they just lost money. They hired someone, uh, depending on if they got a third party to get you in there, which means if they hired a third party or a recruiting agency or, you know, not even that. They're they're paying their HR and their recruiting team to to find talent like you. You know, they either had to train you or get you up to speed to do what you do in some type of capacity. You know, that's lost money. And they're going to say, well, we got to redo this whole process again to get someone else in here. So you're going to burn a bridge. And this may affect your future career searches if the new opportunity does not work out. And it goes back to if you get in that position and it's not there for the long run or the long haul and you find yourself there, you know, enjoying that new salary and talent. And like they said, you know, um, last one in, first out type of policy and you find yourself unemployed six months to a year later, you're going to wish that you had that first job. And unfortunately, they more likely aren't going to take you back. And, and depending on how small the industry is, people talk. You know, so you're not only burning a bridge with this company, no telling who else they might tell in the industry, depending on how small your industry is or where you lo where you're located. People talk. And like they said, you know, good what they said, bad news, fast travel. Fat, travels faster than good news or rumors. Because I, I don't know the saying, but you understand where I'm going at or getting at. So all I'm telling you is that proceed with caution and the next thing is you want to also look at the aftermath are there any consequences involved um are there any current projects that you're going to have to let go or jeopardize the company far as income um is there any sign on bonus pen penalties were you given any money up front you know will you have to repay back anything these are things that, it may not be in your case but i know situations where if people leave before a certain time they, you know, they want their money back. If we gave you a sign, you haven't been, you know, maybe you get this bonus contingent on if you stay with us for a year or two years. And if you don't meet those obligations, they want their payout back. So you want to also look at any aftermath that may be involved. Um, so as you can see, I have my little integrity police car up here. So it really go, it really boils down to you know, doing the right thing, you know, and I'm not going to tell you what you should do because maybe this job offer or this company that you apply to before you got this new job is your dream job and you really wanted it, but you couldn't wait until they decided whether or not they were going to hire. So you had to get a job. That may be the case. I don't know. You know I me, mean? but you also want to consider the aftermath of leaving a job by, you know, you know, for just working there four or five months. It's not going to be something that the employer is going to be happy about. And, and you have to you have to know or be willing to burn that bridge because that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to burn a bridge. OK, let's go to the next question. Next one is reason why job offers are revoked. And this was more of a. a it's almost a hint of a legal question, I want to say, and I couldn't answer everything in its entirety, but I did give you some examples. And at the end, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give you some recommendations on what you can do. This question was more of a legal question, but it also, again, listeners, if, you, if you're listening and you're out there looking for a job or you're thinking about, uh, say, even if you're gainfully employed and you're thinking about making that career change and you're thinking about applying to a job and they give it to you and you're hired and you put in that two-week notice and they tell you, psych, not going to happen. 
And this is exactly what happened in this question. You know, what they asked, what are the most common reasons why people revoke job offers? And what can I do when a job offer is re, uh, withdrawn? And they said, I was supposed to start in three weeks. I quit my job, ready to start the new job. And then I get an email telling me the job offer has been revoked. What can I do? Is this legal? So again, this can happen to anyone. So basically this person is, is saying that they interviewed, did the whole song and dance to get this job, did fantastic, they offered them the job. And of course, just by the, the question, it sounds like they already were working. So they weren't like unemployed. So they give them the job and the guy puts in his two week notice. And most people do this. They'll put in their two-week no notice after they get a job offer. But I'm going to have some questions, so stand by if you're on the line. So if um, so, basically, he gets the job, put in his two-week notice, works the two weeks, and it was. It sounds like you were supposed to start in three weeks. So it sounds like that you put in a two-week notice, but you were going to have like a a week for a breather. And I see people do this too. So I put in my two weeks, work two weeks. I have a week of being free i would say until i start my new job that's what it sounds like but it sounds like they revoked the offer before you could actually do that so first thing i'm going to tell you or tell everyone that's on the line uh or the reasons people can revoke the job offer let's first get to that because i made the slide about that reasons job offers are revoked it can be budget cuts it can be something as innocent as that um hopefully it's not something as as um innocent i would say because i think it, that that's more careless than innocent you know because i think the department should know whether or not they can hire someone and not get to the point that they're making offers and then just turning out or just finding out that hey we made an offer that we can't afford you know hopefully they have a little bit more foresight on their on their finances than that but Unfortunately, that is a reason. There are companies that do reside offers because of budget cuts. Um, better candidates, you know, if that's the case, you know, if they tell you that or if they don't, but say if they hired you and then that person that they really wanted to hire came back into the picture, almost kind of like a relationship. You know, everyone knows it, you know, the rebound relationship. Hey, I got someone today, but if my ex came back in the picture, I'll probably let this person go. That's kind of like with the better candidate. Not to say that we're acting requirements actively recruiting someone and a lot of people think that well if they they gave me a job offer why are they still recruiting it's not so much they're still recruiting it could have been that they extended the offer to someone else that may have declined it or may have said hey let me think about it and they never responded then they extended the offer to you so guess what you're kind of second best runner up and say that person that they really wanted comes back into the picture and say hey you know what? I do want the job. They may say, oh, great. Well, now let me get plan B out the picture. And then they send you that email or send you that letter that, you know, thanks, but no thanks. That happens. Reference check, of course. But the, the last three, it happens, but it shouldn't. And this is coming from an HR point of view. The reference check, the drug test, and the background check should not ever happen. And what I mean by that, People or HR should not be offering jobs without having these things come through to begin with. I really don't like when I see things that say, hey, this is contingent on your blah, 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 blah. Don't let it be contingent on anything. Get everything in front of you before you make the decision. So I really think that a lot of things can be avoided if these things were checked beforehand. And I'm going to actually share with you a quick story because um, I'm the part of um, Society of Human Resource Management, and there was a question about um, someone that reached out or or, or recited an offer, and um, what it was is that they it was for a position uh, um, somewhere in their accounting or finance department, and they um, extended the offer to a young lady. I'm going to pretty much keep the details as simple as possible because I don't want to disclose the company or any anything. But they basically um, 
sent out an offer letter and and to this young lady that they were going to hire for uh, their accounting or financing part of their company. And the the young lady accepted, you know, yeah, I'll take it. But then the thing was that this was basically dependent or this offer was uh, dependent on their background check for their credit report and all that since they were going to actually be dealing with money. Come to find out, they found out the applicant or the person that the candidate that they sent this this uh, offer letter to had recently filed for bankruptcy. And they didn't want her anymore because they were like, you know what, this person's dealing with money. They don't meet our credit um, or credit requirements as far as working in this department. You know, they can't. And it was recent, like the person had just filed for bankruptcy within like a three month period. So what happens is when they sent the basically the uh, the the letter saying that they were going to revoke the the job offer, the girl knew her rights. <laughs> that was the crazy crazy thing, and she actually sent them the section of the federal law. It's actually section five twenty five of bankruptcy code that showed that you cannot use bankruptcy in that particular state. Doesn't even matter state or not. Is a federal law, federal trust state anyway. But it basically said that you cannot use someone's credit report um, to determine their um, their higher ability. Like you couldn't use that to make the hiring decision of their higher bill, you know, to, if they could be hired or not. And they told, you know, and they, and, and the lady was just draw dropped. And she said, you know, and it was due to the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And a lot of states have now complied with, well, now comply, but, you know, have now changed their state laws to agree with the federal laws. Um, And she knew her stuff. She said, hey, you can't do this. This is discrimination. You cannot discriminate me against this. So I tell HR personnel and I tell other people that also know your rights when things like this happen, because this young lady did. Whether or not she still wants to work for a company that tried to write her off, who knows? I don't know what happened. And I really want to, I'm kind of curious. I really want to follow up to see what they actually did. But I don't know if a person even wants to still work with a company that that, you know, wrote them off like that. But it happened. Uh, But anyway, moving forward, I want to tell everyone in this your particular situation, you want to get everything in writing. And you didn't tell me if this was a verbal or oral agreement, if they told you you were hired or did you actually get an offer letter? That's why that's a question I want to know. It makes a big difference because if it's an oral oral agreement, it boils down to he said, she said. You really want to have some type of paper trail. An email, you know, that can hold up. Emails are good. Anything that confirms that they really did offer you a job. Um, So you want to make sure that you're getting everything right. And and newsflash to everyone else, don't quit your old job. (laughs) Until you got the new one, which means that not only verbally or in writing, you want to get reconfirmed details, which means you want to get your title in writing, your the job description, your compensation. All this stuff is in the offer letter, your start date, the day that you start, or which is your start day, where you will report on day one. You want to know your hiring manager, the tasks that you'll be doing, your expectations. These are things that you want in writing. And better yet, to one up this, you want to talk to your future par- boss, which means you want to talk to the person that you re- report to to confirm the validity of this offer letter. You know, so you want to make sure that you're crossing your T's and dotting your I's before you quit your job. So that's something that you also want to do. And you want to make sure the job is in lock. Um, if all else fails, say it go, it boils down to the budget cuts or to whatever, the better candidate. I'm not going to touch on the background because there are also laws that can protect people with different backgrounds and things of that nature. Um, reference check, again, I think, like I said, all this stuff should be done before an offer is being made. You know, that's just my the way I do things. I'm not going to offer or extend an offer to anyone until these things have been checked out. It's not going to be contingent on getting your background check. No, I don't extend those type of offers. It's that I'm looking at these things and once I get everything, then I make a decision. So you got a lot of people that are doing it that way and they're ended up, you know, they end up putting their foot in their mouth at the end of the day. 
if you want to what you should do now is find out why and I'm pretty sure if they sent you a letter or they sent you an email they were probably very very um, selective with their words and I'm just gonna keep it like that they're probably very selective with their words they didn't want to say anything that may incriminate them or put their company at risk you want to pick up the phone and find out why find the exact reason behind the withdrawal of the offer you want to ask the potential employer the HR manager whoever you need to do or whoever you need to talk to to figure out why was this offer withdrawn let them know your situation let them know that hey I was gainfully employed I'm not now because of this let them know what this withdrawal has done also you want um, to be open and honest again that goes back to being honest about what your situation is be prepared which means be prepared for them not to tell you anything and we're in a society where everyone is so happy I can probably guarantee you they're not going to say too much they're not going to lead on to why they didn't they withdrew the offer unless it's something you know they may say budget cuts or something like that I don't know what they're going to say but most of the time they they become very tight-lipped if it's something that they done wrong that potentially can be um, an opening for any type of type of legal repercussions um, at the end of the day, um, if you want to try to go back or, or reach back out to your former employer, I don't know, employer, I don't know how good standing you are with them. Um, it really, you know, it, it really hurts to know that, hey, I'm now employed because someone else dropped the ball. You know, you weren't fired. You weren't laid off. You quit thinking that you had a job down there. I, I can't. I can't even um, know how that feels to quit knowing that, you know, you had something lined up and you don't. So I would definitely see if that's an option, if you can actually reach back out to um, the person or to your, um, your employer and see if you can get that job back. Employers often are more often than don't. They, they don't. I don't know how to word that, but employers don't often withdraw job or offers this is not something that happens all the time but it does happen and the consequences can be devastating you what I really want you to do is educate yourself on what are your some of your options that you can take um, that's what lawyers for are for I'm not a lawyer I'm not an attorney but I would definitely look into looking for a HR or um, a workforce attorney someone that deals with employer relations and see if you have some type of action that you can take because now you're looking at someone that has a loss of income off of a and if you have this in writing again I don't know but if you have a job offer and you were promised something and you did something to act upon this promise which was this new job you're supposed to get and they don't give it to you I would look to see if there's some type of legal action you can take because right now you lost money you lost your livelihood for something that a company intended to do but didn't and, and, and I would see if you could get compensated for that because at this point I don't know if you can get unemployment um, I would check into that as well but since you 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 quit your job thinking you got a new one I don't I would definitely check to see if that's something that you can do depending on your state laws and, and what state you are in um, but I wouldn't solely rely on that I definitely would see if the company can do something to um, to pick up that slack because you would not be going through this situation if they did not drop the ball in some way shape or form I think it was my last question and I open everything up for Q&A right now um, this is my contact information we do have a summer sizzler specials we're giving giving 30 percent off of resume writing and editing services that also comes with a free cover letter cover letters are valued about at $50 um, a resumes range um, starting off from um, entry level all the way up to executive level writing um, depending on your particular professionals where you are professionally 
We're doing 30% off of that. We're also giving $75 off for career coaching and market market research rate. These prices are, are what we're doing. We're running this special because after June the 15th, we are doing a price increase. We haven't increased the prices for over a year now. Um, so we are going to have to do a, a price increase because we are getting um, more resume requests. We're getting also more um, recruiting requests, and we have to be able to meet that demand as well. So we are going to increase our prices. But before we do, we're giving everyone the opportunity. We've been doing this since uh, Memorial Day weekend. So we are giving people the opportunity to take advantage of these discounted prices before we do the price increase starting June the 15th. So I am going to open up the line for any questions. Um, if you're on the line, I hope I was able to answer your question if you submitted it earlier. And I'm open to taking new questions. So let's see what we have. I'm glad that this was, yeah. And you said it was a written offer, okay? The person is actually answering me, and they did say it was actually a written offer that was um, – given to them um so it wasn't just a verbal offer so you did get a written offer again i recommend that you go ahead and take that to an attorney and see what your options are um and again look for an attorney that deals with human um employer relations human resources deal with workforce things of that nature i definitely would say so do we have any more questions well, at the end of this um, Q&A session, there is a survey. Please take the survey. It's only 10 questions. and ask you how we can better or best some topics that you'd like to talk about in the future. Um, if there's anything else that you would like us to do um, workshops on, definitely disclose that in the, um, in the survey. And I don't see any more questions, and I do see a lot of people starting to log off, so I definitely were able to meet their needs, and we are about a quarter till. If you don't have any questions, definitely, um, or if you may have questions following the workshop that um, wasn't answered or you didn't have time to type it in, shoot me an email. You can give me a call. My best, um, best way to reach me is actually going online and scheduling a phone appointment. Um, that's the best way to get me on the phone. Um, that way we'll have some time carved out for you. Other than that, I hope everyone has a great night, and I was able to meet their professional needs tonight, and I will see you next week, same time, every Monday, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great night.